in this country, nobody cares about your qualifications. It's different in other countries. Here, once you get your first job, your degree goes to the bottom of your resume. No one cares. Sorry, but it's just, <laughs> it's just the way it is. No one cares. It's, it's, it's what you can do, right? It's what you can do for them. Everyone's going to graduate from here with the same qualification. What is going to set you apart from everyone else? Right? I've done videos on, many videos on job tips. One of the best things you can do is work on your own hobby projects on your own time. Bring them to the job interview. Only one in 100 or one in 200 people will bring stuff to show at the job interview. If you do that, you're instantly top of the ladder and on all the resumes, instantly, right? And that's just, that's just how it works. And fail at stuff. The way you learn is to fail at things. So I, so I hope your projects fail, completely fail. On your, oh, I've got a good story about that, about university. I told you, Reagan, before about, should I tell that? Yeah, sure. I was in a lab, right? It was uh, digital electronics, you know, 101 or whatever. I don't know, right? Anyway, digital electronics, got a breadboard, right? We're supposed to build up this counter or whatever, right? And they, uh, we go in there, they hand us the circuit diagram, they give us all the chips and everything. And I'm, I'm checking out the circuit diagram and going, this ain't going to work. This is not going to work. So I, I, I didn't say anything. I went, no, no, I've got to be wrong. This is not going to work. So I built it up. Sure, sure enough, it didn't work, right? And I went, I know exactly what the problem is. Fan out. Who, who knows about fan out, right? From TTL fan out. Because they gave us 7400 chips, not even LS. They gave us 7400s, which have massive input current. Right? I, I, I knew, as a 12-year-old as a, you know, hobbyist, I knew this, because it was in Colin Mitchell's 10-minute digital electronics course, which took a lot more than 10 minutes. But anyway, right, so I knew about fan, I knew all this. And so I um, put ones in parallel, so I piggyback chips to get extra drive current and everything. And mine's the only circuit that worked out of the whole class. And the teacher came over and went, you know, everyone's going, it doesn't work. And the teacher came over and said, why does your work? And I, I explained fan out to the teacher and went, what? Like, didn't even know what fan out was. Are you kidding me? Digital electronics teacher did not know about fan out. Digital fan out, couldn't believe it. And so they passed everyone anyway. Like, I was pissed off. Like, you know, that's just one of the, right? <laughs> Honestly, I was pissed off. So like, I couldn't believe it, right? I was the only one who got it working. Anyway. Um, these like sites or kits you were making, yep. it seemed like you were making them like really young. I was wondering where you got all the components. Uh, you, could, you had to go to the um, dealers back then. So, you know, Bray Mac in Sydney used to, what is your company name? I'd invent a company name. What's your oh, business number? Mm. Right? And so you had to set up an account with them. What is your yearly volume? Well, oh, yearly volume, 100,000. Yeah. You know, it's like, so, so you just bullshit. Right? And, and that's how you got samples back then as well. Maxim used to give away samples to anyone. Right, they were fantastic. They ship them overseas, anywhere in the world, all these samples. But you had to go through the form and, you know, how many you're going to sell per year. And, and you just bullshit on that and you get all these samples for free. So, yeah, you get them from the local dealers. PCBs back then, right, um, if you wanted a custom double-sided, simple double-sided solder mask PCB, you get for five bucks these days and you get five of them for five bucks, don't you? Right, nuts. Back then it was $500 and you, for one because you had to buy the entire panel. So you fitted as many as you could on the panel, then you design it for production. You, you know, so I had to pony up the money, which I, but I saved all my cash from, you know, it's kind of a bootstrap thing. You know, save your money, you build it up, you've got the cash available to buy, you know, large amounts. But yeah, you had to go through the deal, it's really annoying. It's easier these days. Yeah, there was no, I, you know, I, you had to fax them, if you had a credit card back then, you had to fax them your credit card. Like a fax, your credit, front and back of your credit card. Like, you know, there was no online ordering. There was just no, right? You had to set up an account and, you know, you had to pay over the phone or you had to transfer funds, stuff like that. It was, it was hard work, but yeah, you do it. Will there ever be a sequel to the $1,000 or $300 lab series? <laughs> yeah, they're pretty popular, probably, probably, because every, everything changes every couple of years. Now it's like, yeah, it, and I like that price level thing. The price level things are good because it's sort of, you know, people, it's all that newfangled clickbait stuff. Right, well, which you have to do. There's so many people making engineering channels nowadays. It's really hard to, like, gay. So don't blame me for <laughs> doing clickbait as they go. But I, d I don't think all of my video titles and stuff are real. It's really in the video. It's not like I, you know, put fake stuff in the, you know, titles and stuff. So, 
yeah. But yeah, yeah, I'll probably do that. They seem seem very popular. How did you find being a contractor versus like a full time engineer? Yeah, that's a. I've talked about this a lot on the amp hour. Um, it's it's a one. It's a specific skill set. Um, are you talking about contracting for a company or doing my own contracting work freelance for both. jobs? Both. both. Yeah. Well, once again, they're they're different. Uh, being a being a contractor for a company, don't know how popular it is these days. Um, but uh, yeah, you'll go through a consulting company usually, and then they'll take a percentage out, and they'll handle all your pay and everything else. Um, that's rel- That's just like a full time job. Just look, like I said, nobody knew I was a contractor, right? <laughs> for like eight years, I was like through this third party company, and everyone just assumed I was full time. And four name changes <laughs> actually before they figured it out that I wasn't. Um, so that's relatively like a, just a job. It's like a normal job, except once the contract, usually it's for a specific contract. So a company, when they decide they're going to work on a specific uh, product, they'll, get a, they'll have a budget for that uh, project. Part of that will be for salaries plus uh, labour, ex- ex- external contractors and stuff like that. And then your own like, freelance stuff? My own freelance stuff, that's harder. And yeah. that requires a specific skill set in terms of how you bill your hours, how you, you know, do you do a job lot, you know, like give a one one figure for an entire job lot, do you do per hour, what margin do you add on top for contingencies, things going wrong, how confident are you, have you done that sort of work before, because, you know, sometimes you're confident, so a, a lot of contractors will take on similar stuff they've done actually before because they know they're confident that there's not going to be any traps in the tools the development you know they don't want to use a new so they'll use the same process over and over again because they're familiar with the tool set there's no risk or there's less risk there so yeah that requires a idea talk to anyone who does their own freelance contract you know it requires a certain type of person you have to be very disciplined and they always want something tomorrow Right? It's always like you don't have time. Like, so being able to estimate time frames and stuff like that, you know, you've got to learn stuff like, I don't know if they teach them anymore. I don't know if they're, if they're a thing. Gantt charts. There's a Gantt chart for the current project. Hey, yeah, yeah, they teach Gantt charts. Is that still, is that the latest thing? Or is it agile development or some bullshit like that? Is there still Gantt charts? Oh, okay. I've heard that. I heard they went the way of the donut. Yeah, there's the Gantt chart for the latest project. You know, I'm here somewhere, and it's like, oh, if I don't finish this bin, I'm screwed. You know. So yeah, well, how you manage project, manage the thing, and stuff like that. It's it, a lot of people. It, it's a high stress yeah. kind of thing. And if and if it goes wrong, you can't charge them anymore because you did a job lot, or they think you screwed up when it wasn't really you and circumstances out of your control they don't care they just want their widget yep. right yep. so yeah yeah it's hard you have to be a certain type of you have to have a certain mental mindset to do contracting not wouldn't necessarily recommend it and 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 then it's either a feast or a uh, famine right so you get a job you six months you're sitting pretty then there's nothing for six months so you've got to charge that into your price and you've got to you yeah, have no job for six or nine months nothing so yeah yeah, it's hard. But a lot of contracting roles start at companies, right? So you get your first job, right? It doesn't have to be your first job. You, you actually get a job and then you um, realise that, eh, I'm the only one who knows about this stuff, right? I'm the only, they've put me in charge. I'm the only one, right? And then you can often have, if, if you decide to leave, they'll often hire you back as a contractor. And that's what happened when I left Surcell. They actually wanted me to get me back because I'm the only one who knew the test systems. So when the test systems broke down, nobody knew how they were designed. Even though I documented the whole bloody thing, right? They, they, they didn't have anyone. So that's a common way to uh, do it. That's, that's a common way. And that's a, how a, quite a lot of people start. You wouldn't go, I'm going to be a contractor and I'm going to set up my company name right. I'm going to go after jobs. It doesn't, you need contacts. You need those relationships. You need... Something like that. So it happens if you work at a company, that's often how most will start. One question. So I live in an apartment now and I want to start to build my electronics lab. But yep. I have space, so how do I do that? <laughs> yeah, I get, that's, that is a common one. You've got under the bed, you've got above the bed, you can, you can hang stuff from the ceiling. Um, no, a lot of stuff now, you, know, you don't need a full-size bench scope. You get the tiny uh, PC-based scopes and stuff like that, right? You can do a lot with very little 
tools. It's like, I bet you can't have your component storage cabinets, right, and, and stuff like that. It's hard, right? But now you just order your parts as you need them. You've got the whole e-commerce thing. Like, you can have parts the next day, so you don't need to keep stocks of them and stuff like that, as I did when I was a kid. You know, if, you know they were really hard to get, but now it's relatively a bit, yeah, I know it's tough. If you've got, like, a little dorm room, that's, you know, <laughs> like, like, you can't even swing a cat in there. How do you do it? I don't know. Sorry, I've never lived in a dorm room. I don't, I don't know. How many of you actually live on campus? Just a couple. Three. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. It's not a thing here in Australia. Who, who knows about the US system? It's like, they, yeah, they will not let you study unless you stay on campus. It, it's a thing. You leave home. It's a totally different system. You leave home, you go to university, you stay on campus. It's part of the experience here, here in Australia. It's... Totally different. Y Yanks. They're strange. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it's part of the experience. Would you ever return to work in the industry? No. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> Damn no. No. No, I would. I, if YouTube banned me tomorrow, I'd start selling kits, courses. Um, I would actually put effort into doing paid courses, maybe something like that. I'd, you know, no. I'd, no. No, I would not go back working for the man. Not, not that there's anything wrong with that, right? Like that guy worked at the company for 50 years. So I posted that on uh, Twitter. Somebody said, oh, he's a wage slave, right? And no, he was providing for his family and obviously enjoyed his job, stayed there for 50 years. Why not, right? Um, probably one of my, it's not a regret, but I probably would have moved around more. As I said, I stayed at the same company through four name changes in like 15 years probably. So, yeah, I probably should have moved more. Trust me, working in a company for 10 years does not look bad on your resume. So, you know, not everyone's cut out to, form, to start their own company. Most of them fail, right? Um, so, yeah, it's like, yeah, you work at a startup, okay, you're there for 12 months and you're almost certainly gone. You know, it's like, eh, I don't know. So there's, not, there's, a, there's a lot of really good, interesting jobs that are what you might think are boring companies, right? But there's really interesting stuff there. You don't all have to work at Apple and bloody whatnot, right? So yeah, there's lots of really niche stuff out there that's really interesting and it's a great job, looks great on your resume, great build, build up your skills, builds up your relationships, your contacts, everything else. So yep, recommended. How was that course at NADA? <laughs> when, I, when I first started this, I, I went, I just like I was going to like I decided to do this full time and I went I should probably learn how to act on camera like because I once before that I had never take there'd never been video shot of me I had never spoken into a camera before that first 320 by 200 webcam I just did so if you watch that first video I'm talking like this this oscilloscope is fantastic because I, I didn't know how to act in front of a camera right so so I went to NIDA I did it you know the famous acting school here in Sydney NIDA all the best you know so they did this course right so I went to NIDA acting school they told me I was the second worst actor they've ever seen in their life <laughs> yeah okay so I can't act right but it's my enthusiasm that carries me over um, it's the most important skill with your um, kids and like your YouTube channel like was that did you have a process for kind of identifying like a gap where you could kind of like fill that in the market kind of, or is it just like you kind of stuff? No, it's more enthusiasm. I, I saw a new chip, you know, that's cool. Oh, you can put titles over analog video. ST Micro, I think, made this new chip that came out. You can, so I did two projects um, and actually published those and I sold kits to put, and that got big in the uh, security industry, but I just thought it was a cool chip. So I actually published and sold kits. For it. No, I just, whatever, enthusiasm. Uh, most of my stuff is uh, related to test gear because I was building at the age when you couldn't get your own test gear, you had to build it yourself. So a lot of my projects and kits, test gear. So, yep, that's just something that I just enjoy doing. Have you ever lived overseas? <laughs> no, I haven't. I've lived in Sydney my whole life. Yeah, once again, another boring aspect that probably, take opportunities. If you get a job, get someone else to pay for your travel. Somebody who was poor, or dad's or you know, talked about money, couldn't afford your lab, you know, three hundred dollar lab work gets a company to pay for your travel. Yeah, that's the best way to do it. You can, and once you're at a company, you can figure out, oh, they've got overseas offices. How can I maneuver myself within the company in, in terms of skill set to be the guy that they're gonna or girl that they're gonna send overseas, right? So, yep, get someone else to pay for it. <laughs>
Highly recommended. I, I, I've done it, you know, a handful of times. I've been overseas, companies sent me overseas, but I should have um, done more of that. I should have worked my way into positions to do that. So what part of your uh, income is actually from the channel and from and others from, like, for example, selling meters? Yep. How, what's the balance? <laughs> If I had a notebook, I could show you my actual YouTube revenue uh, from both my channels, the main channels, 70,000 US a year, which is okay. Like, technically, it's okay, I guess, you know, but it's not a full time engineer. I could earn more as an engineer in the industry, right? And, and, and it varies, right? So that varies. So, yeah, that, uh, the wife would not let me do this full time if YouTube was my sole income source. No way, <laughs> no way, no. I'd, you know, I would ne even need to continue the side hustle, which as as I do. So most of my majority of my income comes from selling selling the meters on my store, because uh, there's a really good margin on those. I found a niche product that's not available in the U.S., for example, and that company's hopeless at marketing, so I market it for them. Uh, you know, I spend an hour every day packing and shipping and doing email support and stuff like that. So that's the majority of my income. You know, people donate. They through the Patreon thing that supplements a little bit, but no, the main income source. And then I've got ads on my website and forum. That's so all those uh, full-time full -time YouTubers out there, there's, you know, you've got to have half a million hits a day probably to do it full-time. Yeah, yeah. It's $2 per thousand views. Something like that is sort of like an average figure. So you can work out how many views you need per day to get that average income. So, yeah. That isn't secret. I've actually done videos on how much I earn. But yeah, I was the first to do it. And I think probably the first full-time YouTuber in Australia, or I was one of the first to actually do it in a niche field. And it's still niche. It's still niche. I don't expect ever to go mainstream audience. You know, my content's not polished enough. Um, thanks. Yeah, content's not polished enough. It's not, doesn't appeal to mainstream. I'll never do that. I can't act. I can't write scripts. Can't, no. So it's just me. Turn on the camera. I stand behind the camera. You know, so, so when you see me doing videos, this microphone's turned around the other way and it's just my hands, like, you know, bench there, tilt down. I, I like doing an angle because it, it makes it think that you're at the bench with me rather than the overhead camera thing. It's just not natural. No, does anyone like that overhead camera shot, that straight down look? I, it's just not natural. It's like I want to be standing at the bench with the person doing it. So it's my hands and I'm just behind the mic. I, I press record and something comes out. So, and yeah, but I've done videos on how, how I make videos. Did you ever be a university lecturer? <laughs> no, I can't imagine. Um, like, I, I enjoy doing this. I enjoyed making the, you know, finding old photos and um, making this presentation. So thank you for, you know, uh, the opportunity to do this. Really enjoyed it. But no, um, when I can reach, when I've got 900,000 subscribers, I don't get that many people watching my videos. <laughs> the subscriber to view ratio is really small. I can explain that if you want. But um, yeah, when I can reach 50 to 100,000 people with one video, why would I talk in front of... I hate to say it, you know, I don't, I don't like saying that, but why would I talk... Like, I enjoy being... But as I said, I'm not really a social person. Like, I enjoy giving presentations and lectures and stuff, but I don't think I'm very good at it. I just wander on and waffle too much. Um, and yeah, no, it's just not a thing. No, I wouldn't do it. Maybe if I had nothing else, like, I might... I don't know, maybe, but I don't know. You think I'd be good at it? Am I enthusiastic enough? I don't know. We need an embedded systems guy right now. Oh, yeah, we need an embedded systems, <laughs> embedded systems guy. Oh, God. But as I said, yeah, I was. I thought about teaching. I was uh, set up to be a full-time uh, circuit board design, you know, using Altium and stuff, and they just didn't cancel it for some reason. I don't know. I don't know if I would have enjoyed it or not. Maybe not, I don't know. Because i that's one of the things I found with university. How, I, I asked this before, how many uh, hobbyists? There was only like three or four. Like, as a young hobbyist started young, and you always knew you wanted to do it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Nice. Yeah, I've done videos, how to get an oscilloscope for 50 bucks. Right? Go, it's a bit harder in Australia. In the US, God, they got everything. they got so many government contracts. You can buy pallet loads of gear for 100 bucks. You get a pallet load of oscilloscopes. And then they resell them on eBay. I, I've done a video on that. There are auction places here that do that, but it's very rare. Um, and there's resellers on eBay who buy these pallet loads of gear, and I can't compete. You know, they just in, they sell them for hugely inflated prices, and they're happy to sit them on their eBay store for a year before they sell. You know, 
whatever. But yeah, it's so easy to get stuff overseas. But you can import stuff, secondhand gear. If you need a 500 meg bandwidth scope, secondhand, secondhand from the US, no worries. We're done? All right, thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you.